We're in James chapter 5. We're going to look this morning at verses 1 through 6 as we continue our series through the book of James. And I'm going to begin this study as I have recently, especially as we've looked at some very tough things. I'm going to begin by simply introducing it by, by, by saying that this is a very powerful, piercing word. It isn't a, a, uh, a, a message that has a lot of um, uh, apparent kindness, though so there's a, an awful lot of mercy and kindness in his words. But as we read it, James was being very direct, and he was speaking to the unregenerate rich, and he was speaking concerning what is going to take place in their future, because these are people who were um, neglecting the things that they had been taught in Scripture and were treating those who were poor in a way that simply was not to be tolerated. And so we're going to look at that. And uh, again, I'm going to lay a foundation. I'm going to take some time to lay it, and then I'm going to build on it. And I always come to the conclusion, hoping to be able to tie it together with some application. So beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 6, James chapter 5. James writes, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will, he- and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived in the earth in pleasure and luxury, You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Isn't that sweet? Those are strong words. Those are very strong words. And so I want to spend some time laying some foundations so we can get a context to see as to who he is speaking to. Now, in the first six verses of chapter 5, James is basically going to give to us what we would call two basic themes or two aims. He has two aims in giving to us uh, these words that he's presenting. The first thing, the first aim that he has is to show the ultimate worthlessness of accumulating earthly wealth. So he wants to reveal that doing that, accumulating earthly wealth, really has no eternal value. And then the second thing is to reveal the character of those who trust in riches. Now, today there's a consistent condemnation of those who are wealthy. It's common for many to automatically consider wealthy people to be evil people. And there are those, and I've heard this, perhaps you have too, who may say, well, the Bible says that money is the root of all evil. Well, in fact, the Bible does not say that. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, this is what the Bible says. It says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It isn't money in and of itself. In other words, it's the love of money. The Bible doesn't condemn wealth. What the Bible does condemn is straying from God out of greed. And the reason greed is condemned is because you cannot serve two masters. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said it like this. He said, no one can serve two masters. Either will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so the reason that James is laying this out and the reason Scripture speaks about the love of money being the root of all kinds of evil is because you can't serve both God and financial wealth. What the Lord wants for us is contentment that we would be contented with what we have. The God who knows all things knows what we have need of, and he's promised to provide for for us our daily bread, and, and he desires us to live for him and not just for ourselves. And he has promised he will provide for us. Uh, Philippians 4.19 says, my God shall supply all your need. He doesn't say, my God shall supply all your greed. He says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So we're supposed to pursue the things that matter because we know that material things do not eternally satisfy. We might 
go after something and desire to obtain it, and we finally have it. But once we have it, there's this desire again for something different, something new, something more modern or up to date. We know that according to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, godliness with contentment is great gain. And Paul said, we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. When you read the book of Job in the Old Testament, chapter 1, verse 21, Job said it like this. Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I came into this world naked, and that's the way I return. It's popular today to condemn those, though, who do possess wealth. And it would seem obvious that this kind of hatred is very selective. Normally, the wealth that is considered evil is related to what has been popularly called corporate greed. We've all heard that term. And much of the anger is directed at what has been now called the one percenters. And that one percent speaks of the top tier of the top one percent wage earners in the United States. And uh, that number changes, but uh, the one percenter uh, number represents basically those with incomes averaging around $475,000 a year. What I find interesting about all this selected, selected hatred and all of this money is evil is uh, it, it's usually uh, based on whether or not the person who is rich is liked by people. It's really more of a popularity contest as I see it because much of the negative that we read about is based on likes and dislikes of the person who is wealthy. So it's very personal. Uh, I never hear, for example, negative things. Maybe you have. I haven't. Uh, I never hear negative things about how wealthy Jeff Bezos is. Jeff Bezos uh, is the founder of Amazon and a variety of other corporations. And I never hear anything about him, do you? I don't. I never hear him. anybody say, oh, that Jeff Bezos, he's really a monster. He's just too rich. I just don't hear that. And I was looking to see how much money he has in case he might want to send me some. And, uh, <laughs> but I, his, his, his amount kind of is, it, it, it varies. He recently had uh, a divorce and quite a number of... Uh, uh, quite a, a bit of money went to his, his ex-wife, over $30, $40 billion. Or all. So he now has, he only has $170 billion. I feel, I feel for that man. My heart breaks. So $170 billion. But uh, okay, what does that mean? And to me, that doesn't mean anything. A number is a number. And when you start looking at anything over a million, I, I have no way to fathom that. How much is $170 billion? Who knows? I don't know. But I did this. I like, to, I, I, I like to find ways to try and get my mind around numbers and things when I can't. And so I, I looked into almighty Google and I said, <laughs> at the rate of spending $1 a second, how long would it take me to spend $170 billion? How long? At $1 per second. Just to give you an idea. And... It comes out over 2,000 years. Over 2,000 years. If you spent a dollar a second, it would take you over 2,000 years to spend $170 billion. And that's not even counting how his money multiplies every day, how it's increasing every day. So 170 is where you begin. But today, because of interest and in the gains that he has, he's got more, he's got more, he's got more. In other words, he would never be able to spend every single dollar he has if he lived 2,000 years. So that's an awful lot of money. But do you ever hear anybody say, that evil Jeff Bezos? No, you don't. How about with our athletics, our athletes? You know, uh, I was looking into that, and I was thinking, what kind of money do our athletes make? And so Bryce Harper signed a 13-year contract for $330 million to play baseball. And uh, that included a $20 million signing bonus. Nobody said anything about it. Nobody said, Bryce Harper's making too much money. You know, Paul McCartney, that's a blast from the past, but Paul McCartney, uh, former Beatle and still out there on the road, his net worth is $1.2 billion. Nobody calls him out and says, oh, you're evil because you have money. 
Even comedians like Jerry Seinfeld, Jerry Seinfeld, is, his net worth is $820 million. And the Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey, her net worth is $4.2 billion. Think about that and then think, when is the last time you heard them called out for being greedy? You don't. But why don't you? Because we don't mind people who entertain us being rich. We don't mind that. Amusement for us is valuable. And so if Bryce Harper can do what he does or Oprah does what she does, we simply say, well, they're earning their wages. It's okay. It's the corporations that America seems to have such problems with, the corporations that provide so many jobs and so many services. And so it's real selective. That's the point I'm making. People don't call these entertainers greedy because they like to be entertained by them. So outrage is selective. It's motivated by personal philosophies more than economics. But the question has to be asked, are the financially rich more evil than those who are poor? And the answer is the Bible has much to say concerning personal financial wealth. You see, in the Bible, the possession of wealth is not said to be sinful in and of itself. Scripture actually points out that financial riches can be gained in acceptable ways. In other words, God doesn't have a hatred for those who are rich because riches can be gained in, in a proper way. Financial riches can be a gift from God, the Bible says. Ecclesiastes 5.19 says, Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. Financial prosperity can be the result of simple, diligent, hard work, both physical or creative. In Proverbs 10, verse 4, lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. Riches can be inherited. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Riches can be the result of wisely investing in the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus referred to as of storing up your treasure. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, Paul said it like this. He said, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. He went on in the same chapter in verse 11 to say, you'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. When you read your Bible, you'll see in the old as well as the new that there are various individuals that are spoken of as being very rich. You have, you have Job, you have Abraham, you have Isaac, Jacob, you have Joseph. You have Moses and King David, Solomon, Daniel, you have Nehemiah. All of them in the Old Testament had great wealth. In the New Testament, you have men like Zacchaeus or Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus. You have Martha and you have Philemon. All of them were wealthy. Not one of them was condemned for their wealth. So wealth is not sinful in itself. You see, God gives power to obtain riches to some, warning them that they should remember him. Because it's easy to forget God when you're wealthy. You become self-sufficient. In Deuteronomy 8, 18, God said, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. And so wealth is a, it can be a, a source of, of, of blessing, but it also can be a source of, of temptation. One of the chief temptations is the temptation to cease depending on the Lord, to forget Him. It's because of this temptation that so many warnings are given in Scripture. The self-seeking pursuit of wealth is really a dangerous ambition. Proverbs 23, 4, and 5 says it like this, Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches, and they're gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. So there are a lot of warnings you see, it can be a trap to be wealthy because it can convince you that this world is all that there is. And that's why God says don't trust in riches. With wealth comes a variety of effects. When you're wealthy, you can become proud. Proverbs 28, 11 says a rich man is wise in his own conceit. Wealth can give a false sense of security. 
1 Timothy 6, 17, charge those who are wealthy, is who he's speaking to, charge them who are rich in this world that they may not be high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Great wealth can stimulate greed. It provokes a desire for more. Proverbs 27, 20, hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. The rich man is asked, how much is enough? And his answer is a little bit more. And wealth can warp your entire life's priorities. That's why in Luke 12, 15, Jesus said, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Again, wealth in and of itself isn't evil. Much good is done when God's people use their finances wisely. We're stewards. What we have, we've received from God, and we use it for his glory. In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul said, Who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? So when you have finances, you can use it for the glory of God. You can support missions. You can support outreaches. Buildings can be built. Land can be purchased. Equipment can be bought. Church staff can be added. Those in need can be cared for. And so it's not the wealth in and of itself. It's the use of it. It's the greediness that James is speaking about here in this passage. And that's what we're going to be looking at as we go through James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And so James desires to prevent his readers from placing their hopes on earthly things. Notice what he says again, James 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich, and weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Burst out sobbing literally, shriek in grief, your miseries are coming upon you. Now, he's speaking to the unregenerate rich. He's saying, you're ready for the coming judgment. You're primed for it. And you're not even aware that judgment will come because your eyes are on gaining riches. And he's saying the unbelieving rich are in danger of judgment because of their pride, their fraudulent dealings, their riotous living, and their cruelty to the poor. And so as he's speaking here, at first glance, it may, it may feel like he's being cruel to them, but in fact, what he's doing is he's urging them to repent. Beginning in Judea, the Romans were going to bring misery and pain to the Jews. They were gonna, they were gonna be losing everything. When you go to Israel uh, and you get to go to certain sites and you see things, the ruins uh, that, that at one time were beautiful houses or whatever that were burned down. And, and you know the history of Israel a bit. And you know that in 70 AD, Titus of Rome came in and, and just torched the city and things were lost. Well, these events were going to be taking place in the lifetime of many of these rich. And that's what he's saying there. He's saying, your miseries are coming upon you. They're not even prepared. They're not even ready. But James is prophesying this is going to take place and you're going to end up being pillaged. Here you are hoarding everything, but you're going to lose everything also. In verses 2 and 3, he says, Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. This is, again, a very strong word to them. He's saying you're heaping up that which you're going to lose. Now, it's interesting when you read those verses, you might note this, that these verses refer to the three main sources of wealth at that time, grain, garments, and gold. And he's pointing out that all of these are subject to decay. All of them are subject to corruption and loss. You're hoarding up things that will not last, which is running the opposite of what Jesus taught his disciples to be careful to store up. In Matthew 6, 19 and 20, Jesus said it like this. He said, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust does corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. He says in verse 33 of Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. And so that's the opposite. Jesus says, don't 
keep up these things, store treasures in heaven, but the rich were busy hoarding for themselves. And James is warning them. He says, your miseries are coming upon you. You're going to suffer hardship. You're going to suffer, suffer trouble. You're going to have calamity. Notice verse 4. He says, indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. The, the Lord of Sabaoth, Sabaoth means the Lord of hosts, uh, the, the Lord of the armies of heaven. That's who he's referring to. So what's happening? Well, he says in verse 4, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, while well, you've been keeping back their, their wages. They're not paying their workers in order to live in more personal luxury. In other words, a worker is working. He should be getting a certain amount, but the employer, the rich man, is not giving him money because he wants to spend that money on himself. So he's keeping back his wages, and that's violating God's word. God's word is clear concerning paying promptly, not taking advantage of workers. Because you see, in withholding their pay, they're violating the law of Moses. In Leviticus 19.13, the scripture says, Do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. In Deuteronomy 24.14 and 15, Do not take advantage of a hired man who is poor and needy, whether he is a brother Israelite or an alien living in one of your towns. Pay him his wages each day before sunset because he's poor and is counting on it. Otherwise, he may cry to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. Now, many of these poor were humble day laborers. They were generally unskilled. They were living just above the poverty level. But because they were unskilled, they were also very often underpaid and treated unfairly. And so, verse 4 says, the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is seated on his throne, he's saying, and he's preparing to judge you for, for your wrong. In Psalm 72, 12, he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. You're living in a way that is only producing in you more to be guilty of. And these people who are working for you, you're holding back their wages. There are guys who will go out and see some day laborer, even in our time, just to bring it to the 21st century, and they may be standing in front of a Home Depot or some place, and they'll roll up on, and they'll say, hey, I've got some work for you. And they climb on in, and they'll take them to their home or whatever and say, can you dig this trench or can you build this wall? And they do all of that. And then when the time comes for them to be paid for their honest work that they did, then that guy says, no, I'm not going to give you, I don't like it. I don't like how you did it, or I'm not giving you that much because I just don't think it was what I was, was expecting, whatever. And what they end up doing is they end up either shortchanging them or not paying them. And then they'll say, well, you know what, uh, you know, nothing you can do about it. And that's the attitude that, that we, have, we still have today that we had even back 2,000 years ago. And the law was very clear that if a man does an honest day's labor, you pay him promptly because he's relying on that. But these people who are poor, who are getting ripped off, begin to cry. And they're crying out to the Lord. And he's saying, God hears. He, in verse 5, he says, you've lived in the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You've lived on the earth in pleasure. You've been feeding yourself without fear. You've been pampering your own flesh. When others you could help are suffering, you make sure to take care of yourself. Now, here's something to think about. People who are not poor can have a difficult time having compassion on those who are. The Lord began to teach me this many, many years ago, many years ago. There's so many things I could share with you. I had uh, an aunt who was an alcoholic and an uncle an alcoholic, and during the weekends very often when I was a little boy, my mom and dad would pack my brother and me and my baby sisters into the car, and we would drive to their home where they lived, and my mom and dad would go into their home on Saturdays and clean their house because my aunt, who was extremely dear to me, she came to know Christ in her latter days and went to heaven when she died, and so did her, her husband, my Uncle Louie. But... Uh, 
I can still remember as a kid, my mom packing us into the car, and off we'd go, and we'd go to the house. It was a small little home there, totally unkempt, because my, my, my aunt would drink during the week. She was always drunk. House is always a mess. Lots of children running around. My mom and dad, and we would go. So I started seeing that kind of spirit of charity very early in my life. And, and my mom was one of these very compassionate women. Uh, we used to say, Mama, you like to pick up the strays. And the way we meant that was when you see somebody hurting, my mom was very generous towards them and very kind towards them. She had a heart for them. And so I saw that from a very early age. And I've also seen the, the hardened hearts, the, 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 the hearts of somebody who says, well, you know, clean yourself up and get a job and this and that. And in ministry, when I began, our church was maybe a few years old at the most. I remember somebody who would infrequently come to a Bible study here. And, and I can remember how he would walk up and speak to me afterwards and then walk away. And then I wouldn't see him for a while. And then one day, I went to our church office. And, and we were in uh, Ontario on Maple Street at that time. And, and uh, as I r pulled in... This guy came on his bicycle and pulled next to me and wanted to talk, and he walked in my office. I brought him in the office, and we began to talk, and, and uh, to be honest with you, his body odor, he hadn't bathed in I don't know how long, was so bad. It was so bad. He was so dirty and so smelly that when he left my office, I have to be real, I had to open the windows and, and aired it out. It was, he was just really really a mess, you know? And I was talking to one of my friends, another pastor, and I said, you know, he needs to get a job. And my friend said something I've never forgotten. He said, yeah, if he can keep it. And I started thinking, you know, I've been, I judged him. I judged this guy. This guy's mental abilities are really not there. I don't know if he could work. I don't know if he could hold a job. He doesn't even bathe himself, let alone clean himself. And that's when I began to think in terms of, you know, we have to have compassion, we have to have concern. We have to have hearts that don't, don't grow callous, you see? Because that's easy to do. And, and, and somebody who's, who's doing fairly well, or at least you have you know, clean clothes and a home that you live in and, and, and a bed you can sleep on, sometimes we forget those kinds of things. You see, James is dealing with this. Now remember, in this, in this letter, James has already addressed the sin of preferring the rich over the poor, he already said in James 2, verse 9, you show partiality, and when you do it, you commit sin, and you're convicted by the law as transgressors. They were already showing priority to those who had money over those who were poor, and he's addressing this a second time, and he's making it very clear how wrong this is. And he's speaking to them, and he's saying to them certain things that I think are interesting. For example, in verse 5, he says, you have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. When he says, you fatten your hearts... It's a way of saying your hearts are no longer capable of feeling. By taking advantage of the poor, you've made yourself callous to their pain. And you're becoming fat off of the sacrifice of other people. And this has repercussions. In Proverbs 21, verse 13, the Bible says, Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. So, we want, as a fellowship, to always keep our hearts open to those in need. And I was thinking about this, and I thought I'd share a few things with you that you might find interesting, because to me, it's a blessing, and I want to share it with you. But this church, this fellowship, has been going a long time, and we've had opportunity over the years to be of help to some. As a matter of fact, we've been a help to quite a number of people over the years. And I was thinking about some of the things that, that have happened here. All the way back, for example, in 2004, in 2004, our church ministered to those who were devastated by, the, the, by that tsunami that, that hit there uh, in Asia. And some of us are, are, may remember that. When that tsunami hit, it, it devastated tremendous areas. And we heard about it. And, and I, I came out on a Sunday morning, and I said to the church, I said, I'm not receiving an offering. I'm not doing that. But I am saying this. The devastation is, is, is all over the news, and as a church... Let's do something to be of help. And if you'd like to be of help, you can put in the agape box, is what I said. You can put in the agape box an offering. And we will get whatever the finances are that come in, and we will get it to them. We don't take a penny. We don't take a penny of that. 
If ever we have something come in and it's designated for something like that, of course, every nickel, every penny, we don't have operational costs, we don't have anything. But I said that. I said every penny will go. And, and that, that weekend, this is amazing, that weekend to the next week, $167,000 were donated by this church. $167,000. And that, take into consideration inflation and adjust it over 15 years ago, and you'll see how generous this church has been to those in need. Absolutely. And then there was that time that we had uh, Katrina. When Katrina hit, I did the same thing, which was a year later, 2005. I came out and said, we want to be of help. You see, with the, with the tsunami in the east, uh, we actually, I went there with a the team. We went to uh, Phuket, Thailand, and I went and I reviewed all of the devastation, came back, sent a work team over, and that work team went and helped to build a, ch a chapel in Phuket, a Calvary chapel. We had teams that went and worked. And then the next year with Katrina, when that hit, we bought, a, we bought a big old truck. It's in the parking lot. You can still see it. It's still here. It's by the house over here. And um, we bought that truck, and we loaded it with things because I told the church, I said, we need to be of help. And that time, we saw $70,000 come in in a week, and we went out and we helped the victims of Katrina. We've done that yearly, yearly. For all these years, we, we send gifts to, to children in Mexicali. I, I have a picture, I think, of, of what we did. I asked if they'd put that up. If they don't, they're fired. But we had, <laughs> yeah. Now, that's not the right picture there. That's something else. Um, I'll share with you in a minute about that. Um, forget it. Um, I'll, I'll just go, but this is out of order. Uh, with, what we had is we had 475 gifts that were donated by you and actually 485 that were taken to Mexicali for the kids for their Christmas. And some of those kids, you may or may not know this, perhaps you don't, let me tell you, some of those children don't have any shoes. These are poor babies. We're talking about little children. They don't have any shoes. And so you'll see them sometimes. They'll have two different shoes, you know, maybe a black, maybe a tennis shoe. One's a certain size, the other's smaller. That's what they have. And so we have pictures of babies receiving a pair of shoes, a pair of tennis shoes, brand new shoes for them, and their little faces and their smiles, or, or giving them dolls or giving them, you name it. And you guys, you guys do that. You gave that. And we love you guys for it. And those babies are receiving, because that's what God is, has called us as a church to do. Uh, we, we had uh, our prison ministry dinner that was taking place, and, and there were 16 prisons represented by wardens or officials of the prison that were just here, that were celebrating with your prison ministry team here, because they go in to the prisons, and they minister to the prisoners. And, and we have the angel tree uh, kind of thing where, where gifts that you donated, over 200 gifts were given to children of prisoners just, this, just within this last week. God does that. We have those things. We help provide provide for families in need here in Newman Elementary just down the road. We, we helped them just recently in Christmas. These kids didn't have things. You guys gave to them. We have ongoing weekly ministry to the poor and needy in Pomona because the scripture teaches us to do that. Churches are more than just groups of people who come and have a hallelujah huddle and then go home. Churches are, are, are made up of people who care who care about the lost, who care about those who don't have, care about those things. That, that's, that's the body of Christ. There was, a, there was a, uh, a book written, I have it in my library somewhere, where a liberal, and I'll call him liberal because he declared himself as a liberal. That's his words for himself. He says, I'm a liberal. He said, and I've always had it. He said, I had in my, my own heart, my own mind, he said, uh, I had a, a prejudice against conservative Christians. He says, because I think that, that conservative Christians don't do as much good as those who are not Christian. He said, and so he went about as an experiment. He went about to, to validate his thesis that, that the liberals are just as or even more uh, generous than conservative Christians and all. And so what he did was very simple. He, he, he uh, looked at giving as in the Salvation Army, the amounts of money that came into the Salvation Army buckets from San Francisco. And then he looked for a city in the United States in the Midwest that was basically equal or equivalent in population size. 
And the Midwest is looked at as being like a Bible belt. And so I believe, and I may be wrong about the, the city. It's been a number of years since I read the, the book, but I believe it was in Des Moines, Iowa. I believe that that was the city that he used to compare with the giving in San Francisco. And what he did is he simply wanted to find out how much money came into the buckets in San Francisco versus how much came into Des Moines. And then he wanted to compare it and show that it was at least equal. But he believed that the San Franciscans would give more because isn't San Francisco the city of love and this and that. And was he ever surprised when he discovered that the Des Moines Christians outgave by, a, by several, several times the amount that came in in San Francisco. Now he's wondering about his thesis. What's wrong here? So he interviewed people and he discovered what it is. And the discovery was interesting and enlightening because the, those whom he referred to as the liberals in San Francisco, they, when he asked, how come you're not giving to the Salvation Army? They said, we already give to the poor. We do that in our taxes. But when he spoke to the Christian conservatives in this other city, they said it's our responsibility to not only pay taxes, we render honor to Caesar. We already pay our taxes, but we also are obligated to help those in need. That came from the teachings of Jesus Christ. You see, so Christians are much more, many times more generous than those who are not believers. It's documentable, and it's true, and it comes from Scripture, to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you love your God, and you see a brother in need, and you harden your heart, John says, how does the love of God dwell within you? He says, you cannot say, I love you, brother, and curse that guy at the same time. He says, because that means you don't know what love is. So the believer actually knows what love is. Why? Because God so loved us that he gave to us eternal life. And he said, care for those who are in need. And that's what James is talking about. Care for those in need. Care for them because they have great need. And he's saying, you who are unregenerate, you who don't know God, you're too busy accumulating things for yourself. And even when your laborer is crying out because he's hungry, you make sure you're fed first before you care about him. It reminds me of the rich man in Lazarus, where Lazarus is at the gate there begging for scraps from the rich man's table. And the rich man, the Bible says, he fared sumptuously every day. He had banquets every day. And, and all Lazarus wanted was just some of the scraps. And that's how it works. The rich don't know God. And the poor have faith and trust in God for our daily bread. And he's speaking to the rich here, and he's saying, you don't care, but their cries have reached the ear of God himself. The righteous, well, notice verse 6. It says, you have condemned, you have murdered the just, and he doesn't resist you. The righteous are being persecuted and oppressed by the rich. Their death was a consequence of being dragged before judgment seat, where having no influence, no one to plead their cause, they were condemned and they were executed. It says in verse 6, he doesn't resist you. He has no way of defending himself, so he patiently endures and he depends on God. But he says, God will be the judge. Wednesday night, this last Wednesday night. I shared this on Wednesday night, but I can repeat it here. None of you were there. But anyway, on Wednesday night, we had all the gifts behind us, almost all the gifts behind us, and I wanted the people to see that. I wanted to, them to see the picture of what, what we're, we were able to do, 485 packages that we're going to be giving in the name of Christ through the love of this church. And I was sharing with them, and I'll, I'll share with you this, and I'm about to conclude, so I'll share with this last story. When our church was very young, we, we used to meet in a place in Ontario called Central School. And uh, I went to do a Sunday morning, and I had had a dream that I awakened on a Sunday morning and then I went to teach. I had had a dream that, uh, that morning that I shared with the church. 
And I said, you know, the Lord used that to speak to my heart, to spark something in me, because in the dream, I was in kind of a wasteland, and, and there was a lot of dirt. There was no grass, and there were broken down shacks that people were living in. And, and I remember I was walking, and I came up to, to a, there was a pipe with a faucet, and uh, you could turn the, the knob off and on, and the water would come out of the spout and all. And it was just there in the middle of this dry land. And I remember there was a little girl who was four years, about four years old, who was there next to the water uh, spigot. And, and she was sitting there in raggedy, dirty clothes, no shoes. And her, her dress was supposed to be white, but it was so dirty and, and, and soiled. And, and her hair was kind of a, a blondish brown, but it was so matted with filth and dirt. I can still, in my mind's eye, as, as, as I'm remembering this, I still see it. Her, her hair was parted, and it was very matted and very dirty. And I'm looking at her, and, and my heart um, was touched. And, and so I, she's so filthy. So I had this impulse, and I turned the water on, and I put her little head under the water to, to try and soak her hair, and the water was beating up and falling off because her hair was so filthy. And I finally got it enough water on it to get some shampoo. And I remember washing her hair and putting her hair underneath this, turning the faucet on so all the grime and dirt would come off her little hair in her face. And I remember washing her. And again, she was four years old or so, four or five. And as I was looking at her, I spoke to her and I said, honey, I said, has no one ever washed your hair? And she looks at me, and she said, no one ever has. But the voice was my daughter's voice, Corinne, who was that age. My daughter was the same age. And I realized what the Lord was awakening me to. He said, you treat the babies as if they're your own. Treat them like they're your own. Your little girl needs. Forgive me. Treat the children. Love them. Care for them. So that's why I get touched. That's why when you give boxes of shoes to babies who don't have them, that's what touches me. When you took something that could have gone to somebody else, your own child, and you gave it to somebody else, that touches me. Why? Because that's the love of God being shown by the body of Christ. Your riches are in heaven. This doesn't mean that, that we shouldn't say, Lord, as you prosper me, I'm blessed, but I will use what you've given to me to be of help to others. That's what we should do. That's what believers do. The rich that James is speaking about, they're different. They're accumulating wealth for themselves without realizing that Rome is going to come in in 70 AD and tear everything. All the things that they thought were theirs and made them who they are would be lost in a short period of time. You just lose it all. And that's why Jesus said, store your treasures above where a thief can't break in and steal with the moth and the rust won't corrode and destroy. Your treasure is supposed to be in heaven. But until we go to heaven, we have opportunity to do good. And I want to thank all of you, and I mean this sincerely, all of you who generously give and support and help. Your works are not going unnoticed. God himself will reward you for your love and generosity. And there are children today in Mexico and in other places, babies of prisoners, because their daddy's in prison, but they received a present. And that said on the, on the present, it says, from your daddy who loves you. You did that. You gave. You supported. You helped because God loved and supported and gave, and God helped you. That's why we do what we do. So when James is saying you're, you're, you're going to lose it all, that's true. But what you don't lose is what you stored ahead. 
And he's pointing these rich people's eyes to what really matters. Because no matter what it is you have, and you know this and I know it, and the older you grow, the more you know. You might have it, you might like it, you play with it for a while, and you get tired of it. And then you want the new version. Because you discover that those things, they're fun, they're okay. I'm not saying they're sinful, of course I'm not. Wonderful if you can afford it. Please don't walk out with condemnation. I'm not bringing that. What I'm saying is you know they don't satisfy. The thing that satisfies is when you see a smile on a child's face and you know that he's out there kicking a soccer ball, a ball that you guys donated, that these shoes he's wearing, that, that matters. Those are the things that matter. And the other things, they just don't. What matters are the things we do in the name of Jesus Christ for his glory. Those are the things, those are the things that matter. And that's what called us. God has called us to do. And so John Wesley said this. He said, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever 